الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم بخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Brother Chairman Brothers and Sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I hope you will kindly bear with me tonight because my health is not of the best and uh, we may have a shorter uh, lecture than normal Our subject <coughs> is entitled Combating Sectarianism divisions and of course we're talking about doing so in Akhiru Zaman what is Akhiru Zaman? those who believe in the one God also believe that history had a beginning and that history will also end and that before history ends there will be a last age <coughs> about that last age Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said as only a true prophet could say that the fitna, the tests and the trials of that last age would be the greatest tests and trials that mankind would ever have experienced from the time of Adam alayhi salam to the last day. So if ever we need scholars of Islam of the highest caliber and of the greatest integrity and courage it would be at that time when we have the greatest tests and trials of all are we in Akhiru Zaman Shall we answer that question for you? Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam spoke as only a prophet could speak and he said about akhiru zaman <coughs> and you know when he said it that you would find the naked barefooted shepherds competing with each other in the construction of tall buildings how much longer do we have to wait for that to come hmm? or is it already here he said about akhiru zaman that women would be dressed and would yet be naked how much longer do we have to wait for that to come or is it already here those who still deny that we are living in Akhiru Zaman are people who are deaf dumb and blind worse than cattle. The rest of us, we know that this is Akhiru Zaman and therefore it is at this time that we are going to be tested as no one has ever been tested in history. Amongst the tests of Akhiru Zaman said Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam the tests and trials of Ya'juj and Ma'juj 
How many times have you ever heard a khutbah from the member on Ya'juj and Ma'juj? How many times have you ever heard a chirama, a lecture on Ya'juj and Ma'juj? And yet, the trademark of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, or Gog and Magog, is already given to us in Surah Al Kaf of the Quran. بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن يأجوج ومأجوج مفسدون في الأرض that these are people who will commit or perpetrate فساد on earth فساد is that which corrupts and in the process of corrupting it destroys the greatest of all fasad some may be, people may say is fasad in the money that we use you know we used to use the money which was in the Quran and in the Sunnah and you know what that money is. Don't tell me you don't know. That money is mentioned in the Quran. Dinar and Dirham. And Dinar and Dirham in the Quran are not made of paper. <laughs> dinar in the Quran is a gold coin. Am I right? A dirham in the Quran is a silver coin. But when fasad came to the monetary system, Gog and Magog <laughs> took away dinar and dirham and prohibited the use of dinar and dirham as money. Corrupted and destroyed the monetary system and replaced it with this bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper money how could brother Imran be using such violent language when we never heard anyone else speak those words no mufti has ever said <laughs> that paper money is bogus it's fraudulent it's utterly haram because they've not studied the subject that's all these are men of learning and of integrity and if in their institutions of Islamic learning they were taught the subject of monetary economics I'm sure that they would have understood it but they have not been taught it and so they give fatwa based on ignorance rather than knowledge so some may say this is the greatest facade others may say no <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down to us a system of governance of the superordinate and the subordinate of rule and the ruler of government of the state in which he Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-malik the sovereign and when Nabi Dawood alayhi salam established the state the holy state of Israel it recognized Allah as a, the sovereign that he is al hakam he is the one who makes the law and his law is the highest law and he is al akbar he is the supreme being but then came Gog and Magog and they destroyed all the political institutions in the world which were based on recognition of Allah's sovereignty 
and they have replaced it wholesale with a new made in Europe political system which declares that Allah is not Al Malik. No, He's not sovereign. Sovereignty now is vested in the state, the people. Hmm? This is facade, political facade. And then we go and we vote in elections for this shirk and we end up participating in the shirk without being even aware of it because nobody teaches the subject. Some may say this is the greatest facade of all but tonight we want to look at another part of facade fiddin facade fiddin we all aware that Allah has commanded in the Quran and sometimes we forget so it's good to be reminded that Allah has commanded in the Quran the Quran that we love so much that when we lift the Quran we kiss it and we teach our children don't ever lift the Quran without kissing the Quran Allah has commanded <coughs> hold fast all of you to the rope of Allah and do not be divided into different divisions and sects this is a command if we disobey this command we will pay a price for it those who came before us we are the last we the ummah of muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, we are the last no more after us <coughs> those who came before us the ummah of Nabi Musa alayhi salam Banu Israel who are sometimes otherwise known as Al-Yahud the Jews they violated the command and they were broken up into bits and pieces so many different sectarian movements amongst the Jews this one says this is kosher that one says no it's not kosher kosher means halal so it was like a curse upon the Jews this divisions sectarianism and then came the ummah of Nabi Isa alayhi salam and Nasara the Christians and they they have been divided into even more different sects and groups fighting with each other the biggest of all division being <coughs> that there was room and of course we are familiar with room because there is a surah of the Quran entitled surah to room and Allah speaks in the Quran positively about room room is the Eastern Orthodox Christian Byzantine Empire which had its capital in Constantinople and then they divided they broke up and a new Christian sect emerged to the West Western Christianity this is the big division the biggest one of all amongst the Christians so what's going to happen now with this last Ummah the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam will we obey the command hold fast all of you to the rope of Allah and do not be dis disunited when each, each one of us is in the grave and we are questioned 
concerning this subject what answer will we give what is the rope of Allah that we ask to hold on to <coughs> without a shadow of a doubt the rope of Allah is first of all the Quran nothing else comes first only the Quran it is the supreme authority in Islam Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr wa inna lahu lahafizun Allah is speaking about the Quran in this verse when he says we are the ones who set down the zikr and we are the ones who guarantee its preservation that no one will be able to corrupt this Quran the Quran is also known as Al-Kitab there are other meanings for the word Al-Kitab the one which is simplest of all for the purposes of this lecture the Quran is also known as Al-Kitab I don't think I'm wrong with that statement <coughs> is there anything else in Islam which has the same status as the Quran now that is an important question no, nothing else in, the, in Islam, nothing else has the same status as the Quran. Everything else is subordinate to the Quran. And therefore, the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, the hadith of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wa must all be weighed weighed on the basis of the scale of the Quran if it is in harmony with the Quran then Alhamdulillah but if it is in conflict with the Quran then the Quran will prevail shall we repeat that if the hadith is in harmony with the Quran Alhamdulillah it helps us now to understand the Quran better it helps us to apply the Quran but if a hadith is in conflict with the Quran then what do we do answer it is the Quran which must prevail example we have done it in the past several times there is a hadith in Sahih Bukhari in which Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha is reported to have said that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam married me when I was six years of age who's that? let's leave the rest of the hadith he married me at the age of six if this hadith is valid the implication would be are you ready for it it is sunnah to marry a six-year-old girl sorry a six-year-old child it is sunnah if you accept this hadith to be valid my question is why have you not married a six-year-old child Will you not at least say it publicly, at least to show integrity, at least say it publicly that I am prepared to marry a six-year-old child. Just say it publicly now, if you accept this hadith to be valid. I've not found anyone, anywhere in the world, anyone, so foolish as to publicly declare I am prepared to marry a six-year-old child but yet you say no 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 no. this is valid hadith but you will not marry a six-year-old 
And from the time of Nabi Muhammad to Islam to this day, has anyone married a six-year-old child? Now don't come with this absolute nonsense. They were already had an engagement. That's rubbish. We're talking about nikah. <laughs> this hadith is in conflict with the Quran. And when a hadith is in conflict with the Quran, it must be discarded. And so the rope of Allah is first of all the Quran. The book of Allah which was sent down to Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. That is the first answer. This book of Allah not only refers to previous books but this book of Allah also refers to he who was sent to teach the book. Allah sent someone to teach the book. And therefore, the second source of knowledge of Islam and of the rope of Allah, therefore, would be the teacher, Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His sunnah and the ahadith. This is the rope of Allah. And we are asked <coughs> to hold on to the rope of Allah and we are commanded do not be disunited. What is our state today? I gave a lecture maybe two years ago. The Shia, the Sunni, and Akhiru Zaman. And I gave another lecture, the Sufi, the Salafi, and Akhiru Zaman. So you may want <coughs> to listen to those lectures because we cannot cover all that subject tonight. But clearly, we have already been infected by the virus of sectarianism in Islam. We have, for example, something called, I don't know how they got this upside down name, Tablik Jamaat. It's an upside down name because it should be Jamaat to Tablik. And they know that. They know. They know it very well. That the name is Jamaat to Tablik. And yet they will never use the name for some mysterious reason that probably they themselves don't know. They will never use the name which is the correct name, Jama'atul Tablik. But they use the upside down name, Tablik Jama'at. <laughs> and one of the Mysterious things about this Jama'atul Tablik is that it is a closed community. It is a sect unto itself. It takes control of a masjid and once it takes control of a masjid, that's it. No one else is allowed to come and teach and guide in that masjid other than those who belong to this sectarian movement. But a very strange and mysterious thing about it is that as I said at the beginning, Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam warned us about the fitna, the test and the trials of Akhiru Zaman. And on every single issue pertaining to Akhiru Zaman, the test and the trials of Akhiru Zaman, Tabligh, Jama'atul Tabligh bans it. You're not allowed. You're not allowed to discuss these subjects in that Jama'at. So we ask a question Whose agenda are you pursuing in keeping your members asleep? 
to the scorpions and the snakes that are prowling the world today. Why do you avoid teaching them these subjects so that they can recognize the scorpions and the snakes? Hmm? <coughs> Here is an example of the mysterious nature of the sectarian movements that we have. But long before Jama'atul Tabligh made its appearance and incidentally Jama'atul Tabligh made its, made its appearance, its mysterious appearance in India just after the body of Fir'aun was discovered. Yes just after the body of Fir'aun was discovered. <coughs> but long before that, in the heartland of Islam, in what used to be known as Hijaz and Najd, but now we have Fasad even in the name, and we have this curious name, Saudi Arabia. Oh yes, it's no longer the Arabia of Muhammad It's now your Arabia, the Saudi Arabia. Wait until Nabi, until Imam Mahdi comes and you will return to the garbage bin from which you first came out. Saudi Arabia. And it will be once more Jaziratul Arab. And oh, how long I wait, how much I long for that day to come when Saudi Arabia will disappear and Jazeera to the Arab will return and Hijaz and Naj will return. A man emerged in Saudi Arabia, not from Hijaz, from Naj. And from him came a new movement called the, they, they did not use this name, no. But the world of Islam at that time chose to use this name for them. That's what our forefathers did. Call them the Wahhabi movement. So you can protest that name as much as you want today. Our forefathers branded you by that name. And they had a very good reason to do it. Wahhabi movement from Abdul Wahhab. If ever there was a sectarian movement in Islam, it was the Wahhabi. One-eyed, one tunnel vision. And as a consequence, <coughs> they took the heartland of Islam into the embrace of the Zionist movement. Abdul Aziz ibn Saud himself went on aboard, went aboard an American warship in Jeddah and that American warship took him secretly in 1945 to one of the lakes in the, in the Suez Canal it's called the Bitter Lakes where President Roosevelt was on board another American warship so that these two men could meet secretly and seal a pact between them and three years later the state of Israel was born just three years later if ever there was a monstrous betrayal of Islam it was this Saudi Wahhabi movement the alliance of the Saudi plan with the Wahhabi faith and we can't wait until Imam al-Mahdi comes and we wipe you off and we get rid of you and the Hajj is once more restored away from the Zionists <coughs> this sectarianism has now been financed with the American dollars and it's spreading like wildfire they're using their money 
to spread the false doctrines of sectarian Islam all over the world. And tonight we ask what would be the consequences and how should we respond? But first of all, the consequences. Two things we have to say. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam said, Man ra'a munkaran fayugayyirhu biyadi. If you see something which is munkar, which is evil, which is unjust, change it. Don't leave it as it is. Change it. Do something about it. Change it with your hand. If you cannot change it with action, then change it by speaking out against it. And if you cannot change it with your tongue, then at least with your heart. Condemn it in your heart. With that, is the weakest, the lowest state of Iman. And around us today, all over, we are inundated, all over, with munkar. There's munkar staring us in our faces from the time we step out of our door. But amongst the munkar, perhaps the most obnoxious of all is the divisions of Muslims separating themselves from each other. And if we do not respond to it, we might end up as a people with no faith at all. We don't respond to it with our hand, the sectarianism. We don't respond to it with our tongue. We don't even condemn it in our hearts. We end up as a people with no faith at all. The second thing I want to say about implications is that <coughs> in responding to something that is munkar, but is universal all around, like the paper money, there are three options before us, only three since we have to respond. The first is a macro response to take on the problem universally. So try to restore dinar and dirham to the Malaysian economy, for example, to ensure that dinar and dirham become legal tender in Malaysia. If the macro response is not possible, then we say, well, we could still have a micro response. And the micro response will be to do what they did in Surah Al Kaf. You get off <laughs> the ship. You go to the remote countryside. You build a kampung, a village. And in that village, you have a little market. And in your market, you use dinar and dirham. At least you're doing something. But even if if, if even the micro is not possible, then what do you do? You're not going to like this one. Nabi Muhammad wasalam, said, the time would come when the best property of a believer would be sheep, ghanam that he would take with him to the mountain sides and to places where rain falls, fleeing with his deed. In order to preserve deed, if the macro is not possible and the micro is not possible, then the only option left in order to preserve deen is to flee by yourself. Go to a cave in a mountain. Go to the mountainside. If you want to preserve your deen, how many will do that? 
how many will do that? We have an answer, you know. And the answer is in, is in uh, Sahih Bukhari. How many times? Satu, dua, tiga, empat. Four times. So it is mutawatir. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to Adam alayhi salam about akhiru zaman. And he says, take the people out for Jahannam. And Adam alayhi salam asks, how many are they, O Allah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <coughs> out of every 1,000, take 999 for Jahannam. The companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam were terrified. And then he smiled and he said, good news for you. The one for Jannah would be from you. The 999 would be Ahl Ya'juj, who are And so the godless world around us will make it, make it impossible for us to respond with a macro response. And then make it impossible for us to respond with even a micro response. And then only one in a thousand will take the last option of all to preserve your deen. The best property of a Muslim would be sheep, which he would take with him to the mountain sides and to places where rain falls, fleeing with his deed. Now then, this is implication. How about response? How do we respond? I am the student of a great teacher who now sleeps in his grave. May Allah have mercy on his soul. Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah. <coughs> his family came from a place in India called Saharanpur. And they moved to the city of Mirat in India. And then when India was divided into India and Pakistan, they then made Hijra to Karachi. At that time, the Muslim community of India and Pakistan was inflicted with very, very, very serious sectarianism. <coughs> you had a religious movement called Deobandi and another one called the Brelvi and they were fighting with each other hatred for each other and then you had the Ahli Hadith and so on. and of course the Wahhabi <coughs> and my teacher used to stand up in public and say I am not the Obandi so the Deobandis disowned him. I am not Brelvi. So the Brelvis disowned him. I am not Ahli Hadith. I am not Wahhabi. So they all disowned him. So he was left high and dry by himself all alone. But he insisted on non-sectarian Islam. He says, I am Muslim. I am Muslim. So I come from that background. And we say the best response of all, and I speak tonight not just to you here in Masjid Al Falah in Subang Jaya in Kuala Lumpur, but to all my students wherever these words may reach you. The best response of all to this facade fit deen of sectarianism is not to belong to any sect. I have found the word Sunni have very strange meanings in different parts of the world. When I went to South Africa, I learned that Sunni meant something I never knew before. <laughs> I have found Sufi, Sufi movements, which are beating the drums of sectarian warfare. 
So I say to you, do and speak the way my teacher did. Stay away from them all and identify yourself as a Muslim. Good. Well then, from there, how do we proceed? Our response is, uh, we'll have to stop in a minute for the Hazan. <coughs> If we are to prepare ourselves to give an answer in the grave when we are questioned, then this is a very nice defense to give. Then we say the first place to stop in bringing about unity, wala tafarraku, unity of the ummah, is the house of Allah. The house of Allah. And how can we unite the people in the house of Allah? Answer, only the Quran and Nabi Muhammad can unite the Muslims. Only the Quran and the Sunnah. And by Sunnah, we refer to the universally recognized Sunnah. <coughs> when we say that the Quran and the Sunnah must uni unite the Muslims, again we qualify these remarks by giving to the Quran the status of highest authority and everything else is subsidiary to the Quran. <coughs> dealing with how to respond to sectarianism, how to unite the Ummah. And we said the first place to start is in the house of Allah. And only the Quran and Muhammad can unite the Muslims. Well, there is an implication now, and I hope you will not be annoyed with me. If we declare that only the Quran and the Sunnah can unite the Muslims, <coughs> the implication is that in the house of Allah, only that should be permitted, which is based on the Quran and the universally recognized Sunnah. If you have a religious practice which you have followed for years and years and years and years and which is beneficial, it's not like drinking Johnny Walker whiskey. No, it's beneficial. But it is not based on the Quran and Sunnah. For example, <coughs> did the companions of the Prophet والسلام, celebrate his birthday? The honest answer, and there are many dishonest answers around, is that no, they did not. No, they did not. So while it is a joyous occasion, Miladun Nabi, Mawlidin Nabi. And all over the world of Islam is a joyous occasion, Mawlidin Nabi. The fact is that it is not the Sunnah. And hence, in the house of Allah, it has no place. <coughs> we now have people standing up and reciting salams on the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Is this a sunnah? The honest answer is no, it is not. And while it is something enjoyable, the Sufis do it. 
and you feel ver reverence and respect for the Prophet the fact is it is not the Sunnah so do not bring it in the house of Allah when we perform Salat and we make the Salams if you were there and Nabi Muhammad والسلام, was leading the Salat then after the salam there would be perfect silence in the masjid and sometimes I get so angry so angry so angry I might get a stroke one day that at the time when I want to make a stick far I don't know whether Allah has accepted my salat or whether he has thrown it back in my face I want to make istighfar I want to make tazkirat I want to make zikr and you are doing something out there and you are using the microphone but I want to involve myself in private personal ibadah and you want it to be collected. Is this the Sunnah? No, it's not. No, it's not. It is a Sunnah to do it privately, individually, not collectively. And my anger is so great sometimes, I fear for my health. <laughs> so, I have given you some examples. <coughs> this is where you start. Will you succeed? Can you do it? Do you think you can take an existing masjid today and remove from the masjid whatever is not in conformity with the Quran and Sunnah? I wish you well. I don't think you'll succeed. <laughs> no, I don't think you'll succeed. Hmm? Well then, what should we do? Answer, if you cannot restore the Quran and the Sunnah to the house of Allah, then go and build another house of Allah. And bring to that house of Allah all those who agree with you that the house of Allah is the place to start if we are to unite the Sufi and the Salafi the Shia and the Sunni for only the Quran and the Sunnah can unite the believers but, but having done that now Alhamdulillah we have this masjid and there is nothing in this masjid which is not in conformity with the Quran and Sunnah nothing so everybody can come in this masjid now and everybody comfortable the Sunni is there, the Shia is there, the Sufi is there, the Salafi is there, this one is there, that one everybody and their brothers in the masjid, mashallah there is no partition, there is no uh, uh, screen, there is no cloth separating the men from the women, no because the Sunnah is I wonder if you know it because they took this hadith and they put it in a place called cold storage it's been in cold storage for a long long time now have you heard it that when the woman makes sijda they must remain in sijda longer than the men Did you hear that? Never heard it. Hmm? Never heard it. Because this hadith is in a place called cold storage. <laughs> Why? Because, said the Prophet, some of the men may not have enough cloth to cover themselves properly. And if a woman were to raise her head too soon, it would be an unwelcome sign. Hmm? indicating that there were 
woman in the masjid for Salatul Jum'ah indicating that the women were at the back and the men at the front in the may indicating that the space between the men and the women was not great sometimes very small space indicating that there was no barrier no screen no wooden partition nothing between the men and the woman this is how it was in Medina this is the Sunnah and when you build your masjid this is how it must be hmm? mashallah today the woman at the back the men at the front there's no partition this is how it was mashallah now then having achieved this is there anything else we can do to respond one more response before we end <coughs> it is not sufficient to unite the Muslims in the house of Allah there is no Islam without the Jama'ah and there is no Jama'ah without the Amir and there is no Jama'ah without As-Sam'u wa Ta'atu listening and obeying said Nabi Muhammad so beyond the Masjid is the Jama'ah and therefore you have to have a Kampung because you can't change KL <laughs> So we go to the remote countryside and we build a kampong, a village. And in that village we have a jama'ah. And the jama'ah will have an amir. And all the members of the jama'ah will listen and obey the amir. And there's only one masjid and one amir. <coughs> he, the amir, now has the responsibility to enforce the deen to the extent that he has capacity to do so in that jama'ah and then you will have micro Islam and that's the best we can do until Imam al-Mahdi comes and macro Islam is restored so what we have done tonight is introduce you to fasad in akhiru zaman and there is fasad in the market, in the monetary system, in the political system and so on. But we have directed special attention to Fasad Fiddin, which is the sectarianism. We have reminded you of Allah's command in the Quran to hold fast to the rope of Allah and do not be disunited. We have recalled that those who came before us were tested and they failed. They were divided into numerous different sects. And we recognize that that disease has now infected us. But we are the last. There's no more to come after us. And therefore, <coughs> we need to study number one, implications, and number two, response. And we've done both these things tonight. Implications of this facade for deen, sectarianism, divisions and an appropriate response we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may guide us and may help us in our effort to remain united Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiyul alim wa tub alayna ya mawlana inna ka anta tawab rahim bi rahmatika ya ahma rahmin before I end there is a book of mine outside entitled an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world. The first chapter of that book deals with the subject of sectarianism. <coughs>